Victor Barthélemy Jacquet is not a French designer with golden name recognition, like Louis Renault or Colonel Jean Estienne, the fathers of the Renault FT and French tanks respectively. Indeed, virtually nothing is known of him outside of a few patent applications submitted between 1922 and 1944. It is this final patent, submitted at a time when France was being liberated from the Germans by the Allies, which was perhaps one of the oddest tanks designs of the war, a train tank, or in modern parlance, a cybernetically connected articulated armored fighting vehicle. Welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Galahad and today I'll be covering the Jacquet assault train. If you like what we do, remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider to donating on Patreon or Paypal. It helps us keep the lights on. Little can be found about Victor Barthélemy Jacquet. What is known is that he submitted his first patent in France in 1922, followed by seven more fillings in Great Britain and France over the next 22 years. His penultimate patent was for this assault train. His patent fillings were technical in nature and showed a degree of engineering mechanical competency, so it is fair to assume that Jacquet at least had a degree of engineering knowledge. The design of Jacquet's assault train was simple and complex, all in one package. Simple in theory and complicated in design, consisting of three distinct and different sections, known as cabins. The design connected all three of them together with a hydraulic coupling allowing for independent movement. In total, this vehicle would amount to some 6 to 7 meters long, with around half a meter of ground clearance. Using hydraulic pressure, the coupling could also be locked to assist in obstacle crossing. Each section had its own independent track system and turret. The unusual shape of all three cabins left the leading section angled down and forwards, rather akin to the shape of the bonnet on a car. All three cabins were vertically sided with a rounded upper hull. The turret on cabin 1, mounted in the center of this part of the vehicle, could, therefore, cover a very shallow angle to the front. Ideal for spraying fire into the steep angle of a trench or for when this leading cabin cleared a slope. It also allowed for the turret on the larger and longer cabin in the middle to overlook the entirety of cabin 1, including its turret, meaning it could also fire to the front as well as to the sides. The third cabin in the rear was like cabin 1, small and angled with a turret operating canted. The angle of the whole roof slope was not as sharp as that on cabin 1. Cabin 3 was also slightly larger than cabin 1. All three turrets followed the same shape. Harder to tell from the side image was that the leading cabin was also narrower than the main cabin in the middle. This allowed for weapons mounted in the leading edges of this central cabin to fire past the forward cabin. All three cabins were tracked using a relatively straightforward system consisting of a large drive sprocket and a toothed idler at opposite ends of the track. Between these large wheels was what appears to be four double sets of wheels connected together in pairs on either side of a heavy inverted elliptical spring, allowing vertical movement of the bogies. Each bogey was effectively split in two, with one wheel pair in each piece and the two pieces connected together via pin, allowing the wheel pairs to move slightly independently of each other. The inner of those two wheel pairs, consisting of the inner half of each bogey, was connected by another set of leaf springs. To add to the suspension provided by those two sets of elliptical springs, a third set, consisting of half elliptical springs, was fixed at the top to the hull side and at the bottom to the foremost wheel on the foremost bogey. The rearmost end of the rearmost bogey was affixed to the hull via vertical arm and thus the entire system could move as one, individually or as bogies. Whilst that is simple enough, albeit outdated for a tank in 1944 which could be on a more modern system like volute springs or torsion bars, it was still viable. Steering for the vehicle was delivered by means of levers and pedals for braking the trucks, accelerating the engine and also controlling the hydraulics for moving the cabins in what must have been the most complicated driving job imaginable. This would be made worse by the fact that the driver was positioned high up centrally in the middle section of the vehicle, using the turret for visibility. This meant his view forwards on the ground would be totally obscured by the leading cabin. 
Protection for all three cabins of the vehicle was provided by a body which was well rounded and made from cast type of steel, of either manganese steel or another suitable alloy. Inside this cast steel shell would be the necessary supports, pre-made for the attachment of all of the mechanical components, such as the engine and transmission. Weapons for the assault train are unnamed, but in his patent application, Jacquet describes how the cast steel body would come with support cast to hold various components and weapons and any liquids, gases, compressed air, etc. necessary for the defense of the assault train. Whilst some of those elements may also form parts of the propulsion or fuel system, there is clearly also the potential envisaged for at least the use of hazardous liquids and gases for defensive purposes, effectively meaning either something corrosive, poisonous or flammable. To add to the burden and the otherwise difficult working position of the driver, he would also find himself sat alongside the primary armament of the cabin, which was fitted in the turret. The rear cabin was designed to house a single 75mm gun, which very oddly was pointed directly backwards out of the hull of the cabin rather than in the turret. Aiming the gun would therefore be a function of aiming the entire rear of the vehicle at the target. The patent further elaborated on armament by suggesting that other anti-tank guns, machine guns or a compressed air mine tube against anti-tank barriers could be added without providing any conception as to what that weapon might look like. As a basic outline of the armament spread across the three cabins and turrets, there would be four machine guns and two cannons, and the drawing clearly shows at least two of those machine guns protruding from the forward face of the central cabin. No specific crew is listed or detailed by Jacquet, but based on his drawings and description, an estimate can be made. Only one man was needed to drive the vehicle along, presumably with a commander, again best positioned in the turret of cabin 2 and therefore probably having to operate the gun as well. At least one other crewman would be needed in cabin 2 to operate the hull machine guns on one side and two men if both were to be operated at the same time, for a total of three to four men in cabin 2. Cabin 1, with no driving to do, would need at least one man to operate the gun and possibly a second to assist with loading or observation. The same is true in the rearmost cabin, with the added complexity of the large field gun, which would need at least two men to operate, so that it could be loaded, aimed and fired with any degree of urgency. That would mean not less than three and more likely four men there. This means that across the three cabins, at least eight and maybe as many as ten men would be needed to operate the entire vehicle. The means by which Jacques's vehicle was to cross an obstacle was, much like the other ideas, to use one or more sets of tracks on a body or bodies. For Jacques, in his free cabin vehicle, it was the smaller leading cabin which led the way in crossing obstacles and this was achieved with a hydraulically controlled bearing between the cabins which allowed for both vertical and horizontal movement. Cabin 2, the larger of the three cabins and located in the middle, provided the bulk of the system, with the third cabin at the back acting almost as a tail and balance for the whole lot. Between the cabins were effectively spheres, with a third of the front and rear removed and with the remaining part able to fit into the adjoining piece, giving the appearance of a concertina effect when in operation. For the connection between cabins 1 and 2, this was formed from three such cut spheres forming the connection, but only two for the connection between cabins 2 and 3. When the system came to a vertical obstacle, such as a wall or even a cliff up to the height of the whole vehicle, it would begin to scale it by elevating the leading cabin hydraulically, lifting this off the ground and then moving cabins 2 and 3 forwards would push cabin 1 up to the cliff. As cabin 1 got to the top, the middle cabin would come off the ground but be hauled forwards by the trailing cabin, helping to provide forward thrust, as well as what traction cabin 1 could purchase at the top of the escarpment. As cabin 1 cleared the top, the destructive effort increased and brought cabin 2 to the top just as cabin 3 started to leave the ground and provided less and less traction. Thus, all the pieces of the vehicle would act in sympathy with each other. As one piece lost traction, the others gained it, balancing out the forces needed. Even in the case of a vertical phase, the system could work on paper. 
In the case of a wide gap, such as particularly unpleasant anti-tank ditch, river or canal, the system still worked. However, instead of elevating the leading cabin of the vehicle, the coupling could be locked and cabin 1 pushed ahead into the gap, as long as the center of gravity of the vehicle was not exceeded in pushing this leading cabin out in the void, the whole train would remain level on the other side of the gap. By the time cabin 1 reached the other side, cabin 2 would be exiting the bank and cabin 1 would be pulling it across and so on for cabin 2 and cabin 3 with the coupling locked. Assuming that the gap allowed for a small dip onto the facing bank, like crossing the river, then the gap crossable could be even larger than that of the distance to the center of gravity. This relatively small vehicle of three parts possessed a remarkable level of agility, which would set it apart from a more conventional design. Jacques' assault train swerved headlong into oblivion as a design. Once the basic elements were drawn as they were, Jacquet had committed the vehicle to an impossibly complex drive and hydraulic system to navigate even relatively modest obstacles. Hard to drive, complex to maintain, impossible to command to any effect, the vehicle, rightly, was as poorly thought out as it was likely for production or adoption. Many of the same problems with articulated vehicles, which existed prior to this design and which continued to exist thereafter, such as control over the separate sections of the vehicle, how to command and operate it, how to effectively lock and release a hydraulically actuated flexible coupling, were unresolved. Jacques' solutions were just like his suspension design, simple in thought, complex in practicality and worse than every other available alternative. There was absolutely no likelihood of this design reaching any stage of trials or production with an armed force as it was laid out. If the technical issues were not bad enough, then the ludicrous number of crew required to operate it should be sufficient to kill it off. A vehicle needing 8 to 10 or more crew was simply never going to be a viable concept when contemporary vehicles fielded by Britain, France, the USA and Soviet Union were 4 and 5 man groups for substantially more tank for the effort. A slight ray of light for the vehicle was the basis concept or articulation. Whilst it was certainly not new at the time, it was at least clear on how an articulated vehicle of more than two sections could have an advantage over a two-piece design. Namely, a three-piece vehicle could climb even higher obstacles or cross even greater gaps using that third cabin at the back as a tail. Nonetheless, the patent was accepted in July 1951 and quickly filed and forgotten. This concludes our look at the Jacquet assault train. If you like what we do and want to see more, remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. It helps keep the lights on and allows us to improve the quality of our videos. Until next time, keep us in your sights.